Hi, some of you may have seen this before. Maybe in a video that I made some months ago. Um, if you haven't, I'll leave a link to that video in the description down below. This is a Stirling engine. Uh, Stirling with an I, not with an E. And it's named after the Reverend Robert Stirling, who invented this and patented it in 1816. But what's powering it? It's not clockwork and there were no batteries in those days. It's actually powered by ice. Well, actually, ice cream. Chocolate ice cream, no less. But how can cold power an engine? Cold is the absence of heat. Cold is, in reality, the absence of energy. So how is this possible? Let's change the energy source. Here we go. Now the main source of energy is heat. In fact, it's a hot cup of tea. Works just as well with coffee, but I'm in the mood for tea. As you may have understood, this is a heat engine. The energy is caused, the energy is created by the temperature gradient between the two plates. Before the bottom plate was cold and the top plate was room temperature, so warmer. Now it's the other way around. This tea has just been made piping hot and in comparison the top plate is cooler. But before discussing how it works, let's find out about the man who invented it. Robert Stirling was born on the 25th of October 1790 in Methven, Perthshire, Scotland. He was the third of eight children. His father was Patrick Stirling and his mother was Agnes Stirling. Robert was educated at home and his father was a serving minister in the Church of Scotland. He showed a natural inclination towards mechanics and engineering from a young age, often experimenting with various contraptions. Like so many of these inventors, he was a tinkerer. He was academically inclined as well, however, and enrolled in the University of Edinburgh in, seven, in, sorry, in 1805. He started by studying mathematics and natural philosophy, science to you and me. However, his studies were interrupted by the Napoleonic Wars and he joined the militia in 1808. After completing his military service, Stirling returned to university and graduated in 1816 with a divinity degree. Although alongside his theological studies, his passion for engineering was as strong as ever. In the early 1810s, Stirling had already started working on improving the efficiency and safety of steam engines. His goal was to design an alternative to the steam engines that would eliminate the dangers associated with steam boilers. High pressure steam engines had been spreading around the country since the beginning of the century. With the engineering tolerances of the time, boiler explosions did happen and it was only with improved boiler technology and better safety valves that these explosions became quite rare. In 1816, Stirling patented his invention, an engine operating on a closed cycle principle using external heat sources to produce power. It was named after him and gained recognition for its potential in various applications. Despite his passion for engineering, Stirling remained devoted to his religious calling, and in 1816, the same year as his patent, he became a licensed minister of the Church of Scotland, just like his dad. Stirling's dual pursuits of a clergyman and an inventor would shape his life. He was in different parishes throughout his life. His roles included serving as a minister in Kilmarnock, Gulston, and eventually he became minister of the Church of St Andrews in Dundee. By 1844, Stirling was a highly regarded clergyman known for his eloquent sermons and his commitment to his congregation. While pursuing his clerical duties, Stirling continued to work on improving his engine design and obtained several additional patents. His aim was to enhance the efficiency and practicality of the Stirling engines. But let's see how it works. Okay, so let's see how this works. I've replaced the cup of tea with an empty cup. 
so that the machine will stop working, so that I can demonstrate it better. Here, between the two plates, at the moment this will be the hot plate and this will be the cold plate, but if you remember, they can be the other way around. The space between these two plates is divided by a displacer plate, which is made of an insulation material, insulating material, I should say. The entire system is enclosed, and at the moment this is filled with air, although you can use helium and argon for greater efficiency, or any of the noble gases. I have no idea why they are more efficient. However, as the hot plate gets hotter, the air above it expands and pushes up the displacer. Okay, That pushes up the connecting rod here, which helps turn the flywheel. On the crankshaft, connecting this connecting rod and the flywheel is another connecting rod, which goes to the power piston. So when this goes up, at the beginning, also the piston is moving up. So while this air is expanding, the air above the displacer is in a partial vacuum, aiding the thrust upwards. But at a certain point, as this is 90 degrees offset, the power piston starts to move down. As it does so, it forces air into the space above the displacer, pushing the air down again until it reaches the end of the cycle and starts to come up again. Once it comes up again, this hot air is able to expand. And so the cycle continues. The flywheel evens out the rhythm and keeps it going. Obviously, if you put a cold source like the ice cream down here, um, then the whole thing happens, but in reverse. And so there we have it. Robert Sterling's engine had a lasting impact on the field of heat engines, although it faced real challenges in terms of commercial viability and competition from the internal combustion and electric engines which came later. However, the engine found some niche applications powering domestic fans, for instance, until electrically powered fans took over. Stirling's engine can run on a wide range of heat sources and its potential for utilising renewable energy such as solar power or geothermal energy has gained interest in recent years as the world seeks sustainable energy solutions. Robert Stirling died on June 6, 1878 in Galston, Ayrshire, Scotland, leaving behind a significant contribution in the field of engineering and renewable energy. His Stirling engine continues to be studied, developed and used in the pursuit of cleaner and more sustainable energy. So there you have it, an engine that was invented over 200 years ago that hasn't found many, if any, applications in the modern world. If they're big enough, they can be very powerful. The problem is that if the temperature gradient between the two plates doesn't remain constant, it slowly grinds to a halt. If the top plate here um, gets warmer or the bottom plate gets cooler because my T is cooling down, then this thing will gradually come to a halt. Lots of applications have been suggested, as I said before, related to renewable energy. And I've included some in the other episode, which I've added to the information below. If you can think of an application for this engine, there might be a lot of money in it for you. So, although research into renewable energy is all very laudable, IT is getting cold. And you can't ruin a good cuppa. Cheers. Thanks for listening. Please click like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And share it with your friends. Bye for now.